Okay, and we're live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of the Visuals Podcast. Today, we have a very, very special guest, Nathaniel Butler. Thank you so much for being here. It's a great honor. Can you please start by introducing yourself and talking about your journey to becoming an NBA photographer? I just sure. want to say that you've been an NBA photographer since 1984, and that's amazing. So if you can tell me everything you want about that, that that's <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, well, th thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I just I, I grew up playing basketball, have always had a passion for basketball, love basketball, um, had kind of a, you know, a strange path. Uh, to where I am, but on one hand it's strange, on the other hand not so much. I uh, I loved playing basketball, you know, when I was younger and stuff. I went to college uh, at St. John's University in New York. Um, I wasn't good enough. St. John's in those days was like a, a top three team. Chris Mullen, Mark Jackson, all like a crazy good oh, wow. team. I obviously was not good enough to to play on the team. Uh, but I was always hanging around the gym doing things and I was interested in photography. So I just started taking pictures um, and that sort of evolved. Uh, I had an internship uh, with Sports Illustrated, you know, working as an apprentice for many years for their legendary photographers. And that was like, that was the greatest experience anyone could ask for because you're literally, you know, working for the masters at that point. So I learned so much from that. Then it segued into NBA. Uh, and, you know, you blink and 25, 30 years go by and here we are, you know. Um, but I've, I've loved every moment of it. Yeah, I, I can imagine. So you started um, photographing the NBA in 1984. Yeah. And when did you start Sports, uh, Sports Illustrated? You know, at a similar time, because being in New York, it afforded me the opportunity to work part time while I was still in school. Uh, and like I said, St. John's was really good in those days. So I would go to the games at Madison Square Garden to shoot for the school newspaper. And at the same time, because it was such a big game, St. John's Georgetown, St. John's Syracuse, like the height of the Big East, um, I kept bumping into the SI uh, photographers. So kind of started help, help them out. And even while I was in school, it, it, it evolved from there. Um, so it was like a, being in the right place at the right time kind of thing. Okay. That's awesome. So can I assume you're a Nets fan? Uh, you know what? I grew up a Knicks fan. Uh, yeah. Because Madison Square Garden in, in but... New York. Uh, I now do a lot of, uh, Knicks games, a lot of Nets games, I'm sort of torn between the two. I have friends on both teams, but um, you know, uh, I I'm wearing a, my my net sporting. Yeah, my, that's that's, uh, that's why I said that. I can say big things from the Nets this year. Hopefully, yeah. Like yesterday yesterday's game was like exactly. a good indication, I think, of exactly what's yet to come. Yeah. Um. So, can you please describe the nature of your work? Like, um, is it at the moment? Is it more? Um, on court stuff or and how did it evolve over time right no that's a that's a great question when we first started you know so many years ago 38 years ago i started um we were kind of co covering the nba from a you know um and an, an aspect of just documenting the games you know trying to create an archive in those days nba was trying to expand internationally there were a lot of up and coming magazines in France, Spain, Australia, all over the world that just needed content, you know? Um, so that's sort of how we started. Um, it was myself and then Andy Bernstein was based in LA. So me being in New York, him being in LA, it was kind of good coverage, you know? Uh, we would shoot teams as they came through um, the East and West Coast. Um, and then it just sort of evolved, you know, obviously we were shooting film in those days. Um, uh, now it's all, all digital, uh, for the last, I guess I held on to film as long as possible because I just love how beautiful the film is, but the need and immediacy of the demand, uh, obviously changed things, you know? Uh, so now we shoot all digital and the stuff is used 
you know, I hit the button, the photos automatically are uploaded to the office in New Jersey in Secaucus in three seconds, and they're pushed out to the teams, to social media and stuff immediately. So it's it's been quite a uh, quite a change with the technology for sure. Yeah, I feel like a lot of photographers still prefer the feel of film photography. Like right. e e even me, like I've always I obviously grew up with digital, but I really enjoy shooting film. So like right. I, I can imagine like you started your career with film, so it's it's still definitely like has place. Yeah, I I will always have a passion for for film. Uh, there is a certain feel to it. In those days, every arena had like a little bit of a different feel to it. You'd shoot different film in different arenas. But literally, when I first started, I was shooting black and white. Uh, and you would develop the film uh, in a room at the arena or I would run back to the hotel. And, you know, I'm developing and hanging the stuff in the shower. You know, uh, it got from that to you know, in New York in those days had 24 hour film labs for all the fashion work and things, shoot a Knicks game, uh, go down to the photo district, drop the film off, have a slice of pizza, wait two hours for the film to come back. You know, just a totally different uh, experience now. Um, we're very fortunate at the NBA. Um, we have a guy that used to work at the Time Life building who has, uh, done all of our scans of the old Hasselblad film and stuff. And he's a master at, at his craft and the old scans just look so beautiful. Oh, amazing. Um, a lot of, I would say young photographers who also love sports and basketball, like they pretty much don't know how to enter the NBA world or enter the college basketball world or, or pretty much any sports you could think of. Right. What would what would be your advice to these young people? And like, what would um, a correct path be? Right. You know what? Everyone. It's a great question. Everyone does have a different path, um, but I, I get asked that question a lot. And what I tell people is, photography is no different um, than any other career. You have to work at it, you know? I tell people, and sometimes they don't like to hear it, but it, it's totally true. Like, if you go to law school, your first year out of law school, you're not arguing a case in front of the Supreme Court, you know? You have to work at your craft. You have to have the background in your craft, you know? So photography, just like any other career, you have to work at it, develop your skills, and then when an opportunity presents itself, you have to be prepared. You know, uh, I advise people all the time, like they ask me what equipment and this and that. The equipment is not necessarily, there's so many good uh, cameras. The phone now is a beautiful camera in your phone. Like, exactly. um, but just start off, develop your style, start off shooting high school games, go to like, little league games or soccer clubs on the weekends with kids and and start off and develop your skill set because if and when you are given the opportunity you know to shoot at a higher level you have to be prepared because you don't want to you know again like any other job your first impression is so important you don't want to screw it up you can't say oh wait guys can you do that over again you know you're not posing players you're not doing you have to be prepared you know um, and that's, I, I, I firmly believe that. And there are so many colleges and universities now that have crazy good, uh, programs, a in photography, or you can major in something else, but work f with the sports information department on their social media content team, you know, both for, for, uh, for video and stills. And that's a great way while you're still in school to work on your on your developing your talent so pretty much like one has to build a decent portfolio like over over time in order to to make it yeah to the next level yeah and, and, and like i said that's that's the same as as someone's you know resume that's that's our in our world that's our resume and like everything else it's 
you know, how you get along with people and, and your uh, interpersonal skills and all of that. But having said all of that, it is a great time to be in our field because teams and leagues all over the world are putting so much of a premium on their uh, content development and their, you know, in the, in the social media world. So there are now more jobs, to be honest, available currently than there were 10 or 15 years ago by far. Yeah, th this definitely makes sense. And that's, that's a great point right there. And um, so you've obviously taken a lot of iconic images in NBA history, like a lot of images that, people don't know that necessarily you took, but right. it turns out that you actually took them. Right. So um, which one is your favorite? Like on top of my head, I can think of Bill Russell's like famous image image with the rings. Right. And um, you know, I, um, I have, I have favorites for a while. Then I move on to another one. I'm always trying to get another one. Um, I do enjoy doing the portrait work and, and off the court work um, because I love that intimacy with uh, the athletes. Uh, and that's never easy based on, you know, time and, and things of that nature. Um, the shot you mentioned of Bill Russell will forever be, you know, one of my favorites. I was a kid, I never saw him play but would hear the stories from my dad and other NBA people. It was very intimidating meeting him for that shoot. Couldn't have been nicer. He had that crazy belly laugh. Uh, and we became, you know, closer over the years because he, he liked that picture. Um, but then in terms of different action photos, there's just moments over the years that I've been fortunate enough to be at the games, you know, um, you can go the whole, you know, career from like 1987, Magic hit his junior, junior skyhook against the Celtics in the finals, and he hit the shot, and it's like he's in the frame, Bird, Parrish, McHale, he hit the shot, just kept running right off the court to like last week at a Knicks preseason game, Obi Toppin did a through-the-legs dunk yeah. in the game, and I was like, what, you know? Um, but I was, thankfully, there is some luck involved, uh, but thankfully I got a nice frame of, of that, you know, and that was a great moment as well. So there's all kinds of, you know, uh, different things, and I'm just always hoping for that next great shot. Yeah, of course. And did you start doing portrait, like, uh, off-court work in 1984 when you started, or was that, like, Later on, did you only start on court stuff and you know, we sort of we sort of eased into it in those days based on need. Like I said, there were there were magazines uh, and things that needed content. You know, we would shoot things for the team. They needed a a shot for the yearbook, the the game program, or different magazine articles and stuff. And I just really enjoyed that. I like the mental aspect of that. Um, you know, figuring out a little bit of a, of a thought process you have to be, you might have something planned out to the T, a player gets there and they have a totally different idea of something and you have to be flexible. But I like, I like that, you know, the challenge of that. Um, the last few years uh, with COVID things, we have not done uh, much of that, you know? Okay. So I'm looking forward to, to getting back into you know, doing more of that type of stuff in the years to come. Okay. So in the off season, is that something you regularly do? Like media day and um, before right. media day, what's, what does like, because there's no NBA games during that time. So pretty much after the playoffs. So right. what does summer look for you? You know, I used to do a lot of the W games, which I really enjoyed. Mm. Um, but like anyone else, it's a balance with life and family, the NBA season is six, seven days a week from October through June. Uh, so I do want to take a break when, when my kids were younger um, to spend time with them in the summers. You know, sometimes there's the USA basketball um, events over the summer, which I really enjoy doing those. Um, I, I finally got a chance to watch that Redeem Team documentary and encourage yeah. to watch that. 
I saw it yesterday. So <laughs> as did I. I, I watched it last night yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was amazing, you know, brought back so many memories and just very, very well done. If you're in film school, you know, you can appreciate things uh, then probably more differently than the average person or fan watching, you know, um, but I thought it was really well done. So we do things like that over the summer. Um and then the next thing you know, like you said, it's media days and boom, the season starts. Uh, I enjoy going to practices and, you know, some of the some of the behind the scenes moments, um, like I, like I mentioned earlier, that hopefully with, uh, you know, things getting better with with the COVID situation that we're able to do more of those types of things as well. Yeah. And talking about COVID, were you in the bubble? Yes. Okay, uh, and how, how is that? You know what, photographer. <laughs> I I pers I didn't go the whole time. We had colleagues that went for like a hundred days, uh, and it's a big commitment to be away from your families and things right. for that long. Uh, I was there sixty some days, uh, and I actually like I look I look back on it and I enjoyed my time there because a we hadn't worked in you know, quite some time and we were all like anxious to get back to work. Um, but it presented itself. Uh, I love basketball, you know, and there were two, three games a day early on. There were four games a day. There were two different courts. So it was all about basketball. You know, I saw a lot of West Coast teams that I didn't typically uh, don't get to see too often. You know, um, we had a whole crew down there of four or five guys and, uh, and our uh, our head of the, the photo group, and they would make assignments. You do this game, you do that game. And it was tough on, you know, for the other aspects. But from the basketball standpoint, you know, we weren't dealing with hopping on a plane, going from city to city. We would uh, go over to the arena every day and do two games, three games, like whatever. And... I, I enjoyed it, you know, from that standpoint. The, I thought the basketball was great. It was all about basketball, you know? Yeah, the, the basketball was amazing. Yeah. Like, you could, you can see the guys were locked in. Like, you would get, like, 50-point games right. every single night. Almost. Right. Well, I think yeah. they I, they did, you know, they did benefit as well from the, the travel. I think if you could keep your mind sharp, because people did get, you know – it was a serious lockdown situation. Like you, you couldn't do much. Uh, you were in the, in the arena, you could work out, you could eat in a little play. Like there wasn't much else going on, you know, but so I think it was a mental test, but I think physically uh, a lot of guys felt good. Uh, and the play refel reflected that. I think the coaches were dialed in, the players were dialed in, you know, um, and I, I, I enjoy, don't want to do it again, uh, but I, I, I enjoyed the basketball element of it. I thought it was great. Right. And, um, as far as on court goes, were you able to get some different angles knowing that there were no fans in the arena arena? Yeah. No, great question. Because oftentimes as part of our coverage, you know, we set up what we call the remote cameras in different spots. And typically every arena is a little different. Um, but in the in the bubble, we could set up cameras and shoot from different positions where you're more eye level with the rim that would ordinarily be fans sitting there, you know. But if there were a railing there or something that we would clamp a remote camera onto, and it did provide a different uh, angle and a different perspective. Um, and it, I thought that was that was fun too to try different things. Yeah, of course, because there are no fans, so right. like, you get more more freedom. Right, exactly. And um, so this was a, an interesting experience, to say the least. Um, what would you say is your favorite or one of your favorite memories throughout your time covering the NBA? Obviously, you've photographed multiple Hall of Famers. A right. lot of Hall of Famers, a lot of great playoff games. What's your favorite moment? You know, it's hard to narrow it down to one. There have been so many. Like, I've literally, uh, 
it has afforded me the opportunity to to travel the world you know um it, we met in 1993 we went to south africa we met nelson mandela and he was a huge basketball fan there was a small nba group that went over that like i will never uh forget that we had dinner we were invited to dinner at his house like doesn't get much better than that uh the 92 dream team was a crazy experience you know that was literally people say it's like traveling with the beatles yes it was you know uh, you look back on those memories and the friendships that you develop over the years, you know, um, and just on and on and on with with different, you know, game winning shots in the heat of the NBA finals. You know, uh, we I was just talking about this with a friend the other day, uh, Magic Johnson, you know, a lot of the younger people forget um but when Magic Johnson was diagnosed with HIV, it was like a, a crazy time for the NBA. And we were, everyone was a Magic Johnson fan, you know, it was so emotional. And then he, uh, he came back to play. He won the MVP at the All-Star game that year after not playing. He was sort of invited to the All-Star game. Uh, he hadn't played all season, but he won the MVP of the All-Star game. And then after that, he continued to to be a part of the dream team in 92. Like you look back on those moments and those were like life altering kind of moments, you know, uh, and I know the NBA as a league and an organization try, prides itself on, you know, things of bigger and, and above basketball. And that was one of the instances there, the stuff we dealt with in the bubble similarly with being bigger than sport, bigger than basketball, with trying to get some normalcy back in the world, you know, um, you don't really, you don't really realize those things at the time because you're focused on work, you're going through it. But after a while, when, when you're able to step back and look at those moments, it becomes more uh, meaningful for sure. And I have so many of those types of moments. Awesome. And um, you mentioned the dream team. Do you usually photograph Olympic games or um, international you know, games did. overseas? Yeah, I enjoy that. Uh, I've done, I think, four Olympic games. I have not done the past uh, few. They had some other people cover them. And like I said, I had some summertime with my family. Um, but I think I probably would like to do one more. I think 24 is in Paris. Oh, um, nice. That could be pretty fun. And and I would enjoy uh, doing that with some of these next generation guys. Like, who's going to be on that team? Ja, like Zion. Zion, yeah. Some of these, you know, so that would be fun for me to uh, to do another one of those for sure. And, and hopefully a last dance for maybe LeBron. Uh, you, never know, know. Well, you, you never know. I, I do think that Steph will be on the team because he – I heard an interview with him the other day um, where that's he said that that was missing from his resume. Right. You know, he had he had uh, some injuries uh, and was not not on previous Olympic teams. Um, so if he's healthy and, you know, that would be that would be fun for, and that would <laughs> add to his lengthy resume, uh, it would be pretty remarkable. Uh, for him to add a gold medal to his resume. Of course. Yeah, hopefully that happens. Right. And um, I think a very big question that a lot of people have for sports photographers is how are you able to focus on the game while you're taking images? Like you're in an NBA final, game seven, and um, how focused, like there's a lot of will that has to go right. on, especially knowing that you're a huge NBA fan. So like you right. want to see what's going on. Um, no, you do have to, like, you have tunnel vision. I'm obviously looking through the lens, looking through the camera, just blocking out everything, you know. And over the years, it has come um, pretty naturally to me um, that you can't get caught up in the moment, you know. You can't obviously be a fan and be cheering, you know. Um, but 
you just have to, you know, it's, it's your job and, um, it's, it's tough. Like you always have to be aware of the moment, you know, I'm looking at the clock, I'm looking at the score, how many timeouts, uh, one team might have left. If it's the end of the game, they're out of timeouts. They might push the ball and Steph Curry hits a 30 foot shot. Like you have to get that picture. Otherwise you're looking, they have a timeout left. They might take a timeout and set up, up a play. Those are things you you do have to be aware of, you know, because like I said earlier, um, you don't get any do overs, you know, uh, it's it's a live it's a live event. Yeah, it's one shot. The game winner happens exactly only once. <laughs> exactly. Okay, there there's a question that I've really wanted to ask you. So you've covered the NBA for years, and um, who is your greatest of all time? You know, I get, I do get asked that <laughs> a lot, um, and I'm still waffling. Um, obviously, it was a huge like when they talk about Bill Russell, he was one eleven time. Like, how do you get better than that? Like, I never saw him play. Yeah, Wilt, Wilt Chamberlain for the younger yeah, people. Like, Google his stats. It's it's like insane. Insane. He, he averaged fifty points a game one year. Like what? Um, so it's hard to compare. Obviously, when I was coming up. I grew up, I was a huge Larry Bird fan. I loved him. I loved Magic Johnson. And then when I started shooting, you know, regularly and heavy for NBA, like we did all the, you know, Michael Jordan stuff, his competitiveness it was like crazy. It was fun. Uh, and then you you circle around to, to LeBron and it's like, it's remarkable what he's done. Um, uh, And you have to tip your cap to what he's done in terms of longevity. When he first came into the league as a high school guy, like there were a lot of haters there. You know, his high school games were the first high school games on ESPN. And, and a lot of people were, were hating on LeBron right from the jump. Like he was probably the best player in the NBA for 15 years. It's unheard of, you know, um, And this year he's going to break Magic Johnson's assist record with uh, with being healthy and and stuff. He's going to break Kareem's all time scoring record. And you you truly don't think of LeBron as being a scorer, you know? Right. Um, and by the way, Kareem, you talk to people, Kareem was ridiculous. So it it is a it's great for basketball fodder, you know. I'll wait till LeBron's done, and maybe I'll wait till I'm done. Um, you know, uh, to, to make my final call, but I'm just, I'm just loving the ride. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a great answer. And, um, just one last question. Uh, so pretty much how excited are you for this season as a Nets fan? You know what? I'm, I'm all in, you know, um, I love, uh, I'm a huge Kyrie Irving fan. Uh, I love his game, KD. How could you not like KD? You know, and Ben Simmons' game. I like his game. Like people, are, oh, he, he can't shoot. What? Like, it's all fodder, you know. And you can dominate a game by not everyone shoots threes, you know. Um, so I think the way that Ben fits into the team, and then the other guys supplementing around the shooter, like. I'm excited to see uh, what the Nets do. You know, um, they have something to prove for sure that these guys didn't get to where they are by, you know, rolling over and listening to the crap in the media and all of that. Um, they are the best in the world at what they do. And obviously every team is in the same boat. They have to be healthy, you know? Right. Like every team is in the in the if you take Giannis, if Giannis got hurt, the Bucks wouldn't be as good. Like that's that's basketball, you know, that's sports. Like you need your people to be healthy. But I do think the Nets have uh pieces all the pieces and are ready to make a little a little noise, you know. Okay. Um yeah. So yeah, I think the Knicks are young and up and coming and they're gonna surprise some people as well. They're not quite there yet. But they're they are building a strong foundation and they're going to be fun to watch as well nice 
Awesome. Actually, I just have one more question, and that's relating to the Redeem Team documentary, sure. as well as like other documentaries from the NBA, like The Last Dance, obviously. Um, do you think these documentaries and films have a positive impact on the overall like view of people who don't really watch the NBA on the NBA? Uh, I do, 100%, because I think people you lose perspective when people watch games, right? You're like, oh, this happens, that happens. You're watching a live game. They don't realize that these guys are human beings. They have families. This is their job, you know? Uh, and I love the documentaries for showing like more of the behind the scenes thing uh, in the Redeem team that I was, I was there for that. The crazy stories about Kobe, you know, going to the gym at five in the morning. Like we all witnessed that, you know, Michael did the same thing. Like Kobe, Kobe did a lot. He took a lot of the pages that Michael had, had done and right. did the same thing, but you would go down for breakfast at seven 30 in the morning and Kobe would be eating breakfast, icing his knees drenched in sweat because he had just worked out for two hours prior to breakfast, prior to going to practice. Like that was his pre practice workout. Wow. So those, those things like inspire me, you know, how can I complain as a photographer about, Oh, I'm tired with travel. Like, no, these guys, this is what they do. Like they continue to like inspire me. Uh, so I think those documentaries like the last dance and, and the redeem team, and there's a couple others out. There's a cool one out about uh, Alan Iverson, like, they show people the other side of these athletes, you know, uh, and it's it's work. And there's a common denominator with some of the, the best athletes are here. They didn't just, you know, people talk about God given talent and all that. That's nice. But the guys that are here put the work in, you know, and again, it, it that can translate into all of our careers. You know, you'd be dedicated, enjoy your job, enjoy your craft. But you have to put the work in. Awesome. That, that was great. Honestly, uh, Nathaniel, thank you so much for just agreeing to be here. Oh, that's it, great. Was, it, it was great talking to you. And um, I really feel like young sports photographers who are watching will hopefully learn something new from sure. your experience and dedication so. and love for basketball. Right. So, I, um, I yeah. hope so. And and I want to, you know, I want to wish you luck in, in your path too. Um, and we have to we have to keep in touch because now I want to want to see how how you're doing with your uh, with your film school studies. You of know? course. Um, so good good luck to you as well. And we we will definitely keep in touch. Thank you so much. Hope you have a great NBA season. Thanks. Looking and, forward to it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emilio. Thank all you right. all for listening, and have a great day.